All right, welcome everyone to this community engagement session. My name is Vivian. My pronouns are she, her, hers, and I'm a community health worker with the Union of Pan-Asian Communities. Thank you all of you for joining this discussion today where we will be talking about the booster vaccine followed up with some Halloween safety tips and ending with a live Q&A. Crystal is here helping me out today. And before we hop into everything, we will be enabling closed captioning so everyone can follow along on the screen as well. So please make sure to enable your subtitles. Additionally, um, all the attendees here, if you stay for the duration of the webinar, will be entered into a raffle for a chance to win one of two um, $25 Target gift cards. Um, if you'd like to opt out, please message us through the Zoom chat. Um, other than that, if you do stay and you are hoping for a chance to get that into that raffle, just know that you need to be able to go to our main office to pick it up. All right, I will hand it over to Crystal here. Hi everyone, my name is Crystal Diaz. I am the media specialist and community health worker with UPAC. Uh, my pronouns are she, her, and hers. I will be facilitating the Q&A section. So if you have any questions all throughout the duration when Dr. Amers is speaking, you're welcome to use the Q&A chat function down below. Now, I would like to mention that we do have some pre-submitted questions taken during one of our outreach tabling events. So we will try to get through as many questions as we can um, and what our time allows. And Dr. Emers, it's so good to have you back here. Great to be back with you. I think you're muted, Vivian. Oh no. Vivian, you're on mute. Could you unmute yourself? Okay. Is that there we better? go. There we go. There, okay. So good to have you back, Dr. Ramers. I'm sure a few of our attendees are probably wondering who you are. So let me just introduce you here really quick. So Dr. Ramers is the Chief of Population Health and Director of Graduate Medical Education at the Family Health Center of San Diego. It's a large federally qualified health center system that serves nearly 200,000 medically underserved individuals throughout San Diego County. He is board certified in internal medicine, infectious diseases, and addiction medicine, and is particularly interested in HIV, HBV, HCV, and service of medically underserved immigrant and refugee populations. He co-chairs the California chapter of the American Academy of HIV Medicine and has advocated for HIV, HCV care at the state legislative level. He has served as a consultant for CDC-sponsored HIV, HBV, HCV educational projects in Asia and Africa. Since 2018, he has served as the senior clinical advisor for the Clinton Health Access Initiative's Global Hepatitis Program, working to eliminate HBV and HCV in seven partner countries in Asia and Africa. Since the onset of COVID-19, Dr. Ramers has taken on a leadership role in policy, laboratory, public health, research, and clinical response. He's a core member of FHCSD's COVID-19 response team, delivering bi-weekly updates to more than 200 clinicians and staff. At the regional level, he serves on the County Clinical Vaccine Advisory Committee and Equity Task Forces. He's a member of the National IDSA CDC Clinical Call Escalation Volunteer Group. He has facilitated several telemedical forums, including one on HIV care at the International AIDS Conference, a 10-week intensive telemedic series, um, telemedic hack supported by HHS, and a COVID-19 outpatient therapeutic series supported by HHS and Project ECHO. Internationally, he facilitates a twice-weekly Spanish-language COVID-19 virtual community of practice for Latin America and has presented at an international WHO Afro region webinar on SARS-CoV-2 transmission. So Dr. Ramos, like we said before, it's great to have you back and we're very excited and happy to hear what you have to say about the latest COVID-19 updates, especially about the boosters. Um, great, thank you. Should I try to share my screen now? Okay. I believe so. It says I'm gonna take your sound away. So no music while I'm talking, I think. <laughs> um, so she, uh, Vivian mentioned that I do these um, 
Let's see, this is not quite, there we go. How does that look? Good? Okay, hopefully you can see, great. Um, Vivian mentioned I do these talks about every two weeks. Um, you know, early on in the pandemic, there was an information desert and people just needed to know what was happening with COVID. And so I just kind of fell back on places where I had trained. Um, UCSF and the University of Washington started doing these very regular updates. And I thought we could benefit from that in our own system. So started doing them every week for a long time. And then I've gotten tired. So we've gone to every other week now. But this is essentially what I'm going to give all of you tonight over the next 30 minutes, hopefully. And um, I didn't really dumb it down at all. I kept it at a very high scientific level. So hopefully that's okay. And I've been told that my superpower is making hard science uh, things understandable. Um, so I'm going to keep it that way. And hopefully we can get through uh, some of the, the primary literature because it's really hard to get good information out there. And at a certain point in my talk, I'll actually show you an example of what misinformation looks like. <clears throat> I love the title, so I borrowed it, the booster, vac the booster vaccines, um, because I'm sure everybody's curious about that, and that'll be the main focus of my, my talk. But I always do like to start with the epidemiology, just to show where we are, because it's been a, a, a really tumultuous journey over the last uh, year and a half, two years. So I'll start with that from the global level. I also do a, a lot of global health work, so I'm very interested in what's going on in other countries as well. In order to understand boosters, you have to actually have some basic immunology. And so um, I'm going to go through some basic immunology. We'll learn a little bit together. And don't worry, it's not too intimidating. Lots of pictures of just how the immune system works because it's extremely complicated. And you need to sort of know what's going on before you understand vaccines and then boosters. And then I'll get to the who, what, when, where, and why. I think I'll probably go why, what, who, when, and where in that order. And hopefully we'll have time for questions afterwards. So. Um, and I'm going to welcome anybody to type something in the chat, too, if you want to uh, want me to expand on it a little bit later. So let's start at the global level. This is from the Johns Hopkins website that's been probably the best at compiling all the data around the world about COVID. And you can see that 240 million cases of COVID that are known about, probably way more than that have actually happened, but those are the confirmed cases. And then there's been almost 5 million people that have died of COVID. Um, for those that are hesitant to get the vaccine because they don't think we have enough experience with it, look at that number in green. There's been almost 6.6 .6 billion vaccines administered around the world. This is the largest vaccination campaign in the history of humankind, and it's been studied more than any other vaccine campaign ever. So um, if you want to wait and see, you know, it's been long enough where we, we really know these vaccines quite well. You can see the U.S. on the left-hand side. Uh, let me get my little pen working here. Um, is the leader of the pack here with the most cases out of any other country. The UK is actually getting, and this is only the last 28 days actually, the UK unfortunately is having a little winter surge going on. And then you have some places in Eastern Europe and Russia starting to surge again. India and Brazil have had a lot of cases just because of their massive population size. And then the Philippines has had a really pretty rough time in the last couple of months as well. This is what the global case count looks like. And you can see all the different regions um, by the WHO in different colors here. Um, the big purple region here, this contained the huge surge that happened in India when the Delta variant first came around. Uh, that was really our, our big peak that happened in April. Um, and then this is sort of the Delta surge around the US where we've had just a whole lot of cases, uh, mostly in the Americas and elsewhere. And what's going on right now is that Europe is kind of starting to surge again right here especially Eastern Europe and places like Russia that have really low vaccination rates. This black line here is the death rate that's been kind of going up and down, up and down. Thankfully, I, I think it's probably peaked because these times back here when we had such high death rates up here, um, those were times when we really didn't have much of the world vaccinated. And you can see the case numbers in the last um, report, at least from the WHO, are really driven by the US. We have a lot more COVID than anywhere, anywhere else. And then the UK, Russia, Turkey, and India are still having lots of case numbers here. On to the US, and we'll sort of zero in on what's going on. This is the case map where the darker the county is, the more COVID is there using case standardized case number rates. And if I showed you this about a month and a half ago, it would look very different, actually. Uh, the Southeast, these states, Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama, Georgia, Florida, were just on fire with just a huge um, outbreak. And things just sort of go up and down. They wax and wane in the US. You can see Alaska is in a very bad place right now. 
Um, their hospitals have been completely full for months and people being turned away from the hospital. Montana and Wyoming and North Dakota and Wisconsin, so sort of the upper Midwest states are actually having a really hard time right now. And California has been in pretty good shape, at least in places where there's been um, vaccinations. Um, many people want to think COVID is over, but unfortunately it's not. We still are having about 79,000 new cases a day, about 60,000 people in the hospital. And then unfortunately the death rate is still left over from the Delta surge really quite high. It takes about four to six weeks to die from COVID um, from the time that you first get it. So the death rates, that deaths that we're seeing now are really because of the surge that happened in August and September. And 1,500 people dying a day is really a lot. We shouldn't get um, numb to that really, really high number. Here's the curves for cases on the top left, hospitalizations in the middle, and then deaths on the bottom right. And you can see that things are getting better. We're having a, a decline in cases, which is great. Um, something that's been observed in COVID throughout the world is that it tends to go like gangbusters through a place. And, and usually it's about two months uh, where things start to turn around and either people get vaccinated or they start taking it seriously, or it's just infected as many people as it can in that particular location and they start to turn downwards. But you'll notice that the death curve lags a little bit. So that's still pretty high with about 1,500 deaths per day. And if we look state by state, um, you know, like I said, Alaska is, is really in trouble here. Um, and you'll notice that here's a, here's a note that I'll get to a little bit later. Um, 857 cases is the daily average in Alaska, which doesn't sound like a lot, especially because other places like California have 5,000. But you got to look at the denominator. Um, Alaska has only... 700,000 people in the entire state. That's a third of the population of San Diego County. So you do the rate calculation and you end up with a really, really high rate of COVID that's happening in Alaska, really, really high there, 117. That's the highest what we've seen in any other state. And it sort of correlates with the vaccination rates. And you can see their vaccination rates is about 50%. California is about 60, which is not really great as it is. Um, but uh, of course, a lot of kids aren't really eligible yet. So California, uh, you have to go way down to number 47 in terms of states and, and case rates, which means that we've done a pretty good job. And, and as much as public health officials have been battered in the news and lockdowns are bad for the economy and all that kind of stuff, we've done quite a good job getting our populations vaccinated who are eligible. Um, the people that are eligible, the number is more like 70% that are vaccinated in California. And then the policies have really kept the case rates down relatively low in our state. In terms of ongoing transmission, this map on the bottom right used to be bright red for a long time, actually all the way through most of August and September. Um, and finally, counties are starting to see lower rates of transmission. And that's defined here very specifically by the CDC, um, that if you have um, high transmission, it's greater than 100 uh, cases per 100,000 in the past week or a 10% positive rate. And we're starting to fall down there. You can see most of Southern California is now orange. Um, as some parts of Northern California getting into the yellow or the moderate transmission range. And that's really a good thing. California, here's just a, another picture of the California numbers. I'll show you the, the case numbers, the hospitalizations, the ICU, and then the bottom, the deaths. And the good thing here is that look at the difference between the, the peak of that death curve there and our winter surge versus this down here. And part of that is really because of the success of vaccinations. Um, California started publishing, and a lot of places have started publishing the differences between case rates, hospitalizations, and deaths in vaccinated versus unvaccinated people. Here's the curve for the state of California, which is that really this, this August, September surge is almost entirely in, in unvaccinated people. Um, and uh, it's getting less and less and less uh, because the numbers are going down for everybody, but um, they say 6.6 .6 times more likely uh, to have a case of COVID in California if you're unvaccinated. Um, let's get into those numbers a little more deeply in San Diego. So the county has now published these curves, which are the case rates, and then I'll show you hospitalizations and deaths a little bit later. But the case rate here overall for the county is in blue. Uh, and so you can see we had our little surge here, August, September, going down, which is good, but you separate that into unvaccinated and vaccinated. And the unvaccinated or not fully vaccinated is this orange curve. So it's just way higher than those who are fully vaccinated. Now, what you can see is that people that are fully vaccinated are still getting COVID. So this is not zero. This is actually, you know, a little surge. These are called breakthrough cases. Um, and although we were spoiled initially in the vaccines when the results of the clinical trials looked so amazingly good at 95%, um, with time and with new variants coming in, the Delta variant, 
that 95% has fallen a little bit in sort of the 70s and, and 80%, especially in people that are more vulnerable, um, those that are older or immunocompromised. But let me show you the next couple of slides to show you the real benefit of vaccine. You can see in San Diego, um, being unvaccinated has a threefold higher risk of getting COVID just by the, the sheer numbers. When we look at hospitalizations, it's much more dramatic. So this is evidence of the vaccines doing exactly what they're supposed to do, which is to keep you alive and keep you from getting very, very sick. Um, the county uh, hospitalization rate is here in blue, and you can see that sort of average there, but it's almost all unvaccinated people. Um, so, you know, if you're working in a hospital environment or in a, in a monoclonal antibody clinic like I do, uh, most of the people we're seeing that are very, very sick are the, are the unvaccinated people coming in. Um, and the vaccinated people, if they get COVID, they're tending to be very mild cases and very few admissions to the hospital among those that are vaccinated. What does that mean? It means their immune system is not able to completely defend them from getting COVID into their nose because that depends on more if they're around somebody who's infected, who coughs or sneezes or breathes on them. But once they do get the COVID virus in their body, they're pretty much able to handle it because their immune system has already been trained and is well prepared for it. Uh, doing the numbers, you are 100 times more likely to be in the hospital with COVID if you are unvaccinated versus being vaccinated. So very, very dramatic difference there. And here's just another way to look at these, these numbers where people in the orange bars here are fully vaccinated and the blue bars are unvaccinated. And you can see the cases are, you know, there are people getting COVID who are vaccinated, but they're just not really tending to get in the hospital uh, as you can see here, and not really tending to die. Now, the, the death numbers look a little bit bigger because uh, some of these people are extremely vulnerable um, in, the, in their 80s or so or immune compromised, and the vaccines are not fully protecting them because they're not fully responding to the vaccines. And this makes me think of Colin Powell. Um, so this is a, a man who was in his 80s and who was fighting a blood cancer called multiple myeloma, which is a leukemia, essentially. So he was profoundly immunosuppressed. Um, probably didn't really respond to the vaccines and probably should have gotten a booster dose. I'm not sure if he did or not. Um, those are the types of people that are having serious breakthrough infections. Again, overall, when you look at the numbers here, this is the county's numbers since March, and 76% of the cases have occurred in people that are not vaccinated, 95% of the hospitalizations, and 85% of the deaths. And believe me, I've been looking at these numbers like every single week, and they're pretty much very stable. The one thing that's changing is that we're probably seeing a greater proportion of fully vaccinated people that are getting COVID. And part of that is because there's not many people left that are not vaccinated. Um, I think I'll show you the numbers in a little bit, but you know, 90% of people in San Diego who are eligible have had at least one dose and 80% of people are actually fully vaccinated. So the pool of uh, people left for the virus to still infect is quite small. Um, the numbers, just if you want to look, look at them, that means out of 2.8 million people in San Diego eligible, 2.2 million people have been vaccinated. That's about 80%. And uh, 250,000 have gotten one dose, and then only 290,000 are fully, fully unvaccinated. So let's do a little exercise in misinformation here. So I have this little ongoing um, friendly battle, I would say, with a, with a local news network. Um, that I think does a really bad service to the community by presenting misinformation. So they came out with a story and I was really sad to see that it's one of their most popular stories. And they said, more vaccinated people testing positive for COVID than unvaccinated people in the county. And they had a guy on who just went through this as a reason for why the vaccines don't work and nobody should get them and that it was a stupid idea. And they showed these numbers where 1,300 people in the last week got COVID who are unvaccinated and 1,500 people got COVID who are vaccinated. So in the first case, I, I checked with the county um, public health department and they said the numbers are not fully updated. So first of all, these numbers are probably a little bit wrong, but even if they are correct, um, what this, uh, this story didn't really emphasize is the fact that look at the death numbers, 57, uh, sorry, 57 hospitalizations occurred in unvaccinated and three in vaccinated people. And then 29 of the deaths and three in the, uh, in the vaccinated, 29 unvaccinated. And those percentages are really uh, quite striking that 90% of the deaths or 95% of the hospitalizations are occurring in unvaccinated people, which means a lot of the people that are vaccinated and still getting COVID are getting very mild cases. And that's exactly what we want the vaccine to do. Um, then you put the denominators in here, like I said, and 1500 people 
sounds like a big number, but when it's out of 2.2 million, it's not that big a number. And the, the relative percentage is quite low, whereas 1,300 actually becomes kind of a bigger number when we're talking about a denominator that's that low. And so what epidemiologists do when they're looking at this is they don't look at the absolute numbers, they look at rates. And when I showed you the state-by-state -state breakdown of cases in Alaska and everything, um, you know, if you use the population of Alaska versus the population of California, they're very different and they give you different rates. So let's go ahead and do that. This is epidemiology 101. When we calculate the rates, um, those are just some pie charts to show you all the green unvaccinated people that are getting hospitalized and dying. You calculate the rates and there's no comparison at all. You have so much higher levels of cases and hospitalizations and death rates um, in the people that are unvaccinated. So um, we as healthcare workers have been urging from the very beginning when we had these vaccines, urging people to get them because we know that this is our best way to protect ourselves against COVID. And we keep seeing over and over tragic cases of families being ripped apart, of people even getting relatively young people who are dying in their 30s and 40s and 50s um, and leaving their family behind. And we're getting sick of it. We're getting sick of seeing it. And that's why we've been harping on vaccination as really the best way out of it. And unfortunately, the anti-vax um, forces that are out there are really just feeding on some of this misinformation and spreading it really faster than, than unfortunately we're able to spread scientific information. So I'm gonna get off my soapbox there um, and move on. So let's get to some basic immunology. Um, I'm, I'm gonna use a lot of pictures, so this shouldn't be too bad. Um, first of all, um, when people get exposed to COVID, um, the viral levels tend to start to go up. These are little viruses here with a little RNA inside them, even before the symptoms start. So viral replication really starts right away right here. And then usually maybe two days later, someone will start to have symptoms. Um, that's when the viral levels are the highest. That's when the person is most contagious. And that's when the test, uh, the PCR test or the antigen test that you get in your nose is gonna be positive. The immune system really doesn't begin to respond until about um, 10 to 15 days afterwards. And then it starts to make these things called antibodies. And here's what they actually look like. They're sort of shaped like little Ys and they are designed to, to block viruses or even react to bacteria and sort of tag them and kill them so your immune system uh, can really take care of them. Notice that it takes about two weeks for that to even begin to happen. And so if you're gonna sort of test for those antibodies, we don't really even see them until two weeks after. That's why you don't really start to get protection from a vaccine until about two weeks after as well. Now, this is an important timeline because it actually correlates with what we see clinically with symptoms. So people, tend to get their symptoms early. And then if you were to do a chest, a scan of their lungs, they would be totally clear at the time that they have their flu-like symptoms. And it takes a whole nother two weeks until you move into this really yucky looking CT here where people are having a lot of trouble breathing and, and having low oxygen levels. It turns out that's actually the immune response, the host immune response that's causing most of that damage and that injury, not the virus. The virus tends to be actually gone by then. So if somebody survives and they, they don't have to go in the hospital or they, they um, get, recover from COVID, first of all, people say, well, natural immunity is best. Well, it's not great for people to get really sick in the hospital or die. It didn't really serve them during that, that first episode. But what does happen eventually is that you develop a very complicated immune system response that gives you memory. So the immune system has cells called T cells. It has cells called B cells that make antibodies. And in the beginning, over that two weeks, you get a big response with all of these things and they get really, really angry. And then eventually you have antibodies here in, in green that are, that are built and then they actually naturally will fall. And if you think about it, you're facing cold and flu viruses all the time. Every winter you're exposed to a lot of these viruses and you get over them. Every cold you've ever had, you've probably gotten over and then you develop antibodies. And if your body kept antibodies at the really super high levels that they were at the beginning, your blood would turn to cement. It would not be able to flow through your body. So what naturally happens is antibody levels go down and you develop what's called memory. You have memory in your B cells so that if they get exposed to that virus again, they're able to shoot right up really quickly and protect you from dying. It might not pre prevent you from getting it, but it'll protect you from dying. And that's something called an anamnestic response here. Basically, it's a memory response. So this is exactly what we're seeing with people that have recovered from COVID or people that have gotten vaccinated for COVID is that the antibody levels will naturally decline 
And then the thought is either being re-exposed or getting a booster shot will actually give you additional protection and probably reinforce that memory that you have. Now, this is all extremely complicated and it's happening in multiple sites in your body, in your nose, in your mouth, inside your lungs. And it consists of all these things that I've talked about, um, including the B cells, the T cells, and the antibodies all kind of working together. You also have a disease that has a very big spectrum of what people get. Some people get super sick and they die and go in the ICU and in red here. And some people actually even have uh, no symptoms at all when they have COVID. Um, so putting these two things together, the part of your immune system that we think protects you most from actually getting the infection at all is going to be the antibodies. Uh, there was a study that estimated antibodies make about 68% of the full protection from actually getting infected. But then there's all these other parts of your immune system that help you protect you from getting really sick and from dying. Um, okay, I hope that makes sense. I'm going to skip the next slide because it's a little too complicated. But here's what we think is happening with different types of people. Unvaccinated people are exposed to the full spectrum of COVID. Some of them have asymptomatic infection. Some of them have a few symptoms. Some of them have cold, some have flu-like, and some get really, really sick and hospitalized and die. And with the Delta variant, that's actually probably um, even a greater percentage of people. If you're vaccinated, most people will have no infection because they have really nice high levels of those antibodies. Um, but some may have these called so-called breakthrough infections here, but it's a really, really small percentage of them. Now, as your antibody levels fade through time, which is normal, remember, you don't want your blood to be cement, probably a bigger proportion of people are going to get breakthrough infections, but it's, it's mostly mild illness here. And so this is why we're seeing people, even with breakthrough infections, not develop a lot of severe symptoms. And you have just a tiny little bit that are having hospitalization or death. Uh, people that are immunocompromised or elderly are probably more vulnerable to those breakthrough infections that are going to be serious. All right, I hope I didn't lose anybody there. Um, just to summarize the immunology here, the immune response to either a vaccination or a natural infection is complicated. Um, only small parts of it are easy to measure, um, uh, such as the antibody levels. So we don't have a really good test that I can send as a doctor and say, let me just see what your memory B cells or your memory T cells look like. We just don't have it. So we measure antibodies. Um, natural immunity doesn't really do a great job in about 10 to 15% of people who end up having to go into the hospital or the ICU. And then one to 2% of people die actually from the first time around, mostly those who are older. Um, it also might be variant specific and it may fade away after six months. So there's a debate going on about natural immunity versus vaccine mediated immunity. Um, and in my opinion, natural immunity can be good in some people. Uh, it, is, it is quite good in some people who don't ever get reinfected, but it's highly variable. And in some people it doesn't last very long and doesn't protect them again. Um, I mentioned that the immune system is very complicated. We have antibodies, memory B cells, memory T cells, and the antibodies are generally what protect you from getting infected in the first place. And then those memory Bs, B cells and T cells are what give you that anamnestic response. If you get exposed to COVID three months after your vaccine, then that's going to protect you from uh, getting really sick. What booster doses do is they basically remind the immune system of that virus, temporarily increase your antibody levels again, and then they'll consolidate and strengthen those memory responses. Um, and here's just some pictures to show you the, the characters again. So I hope I didn't lose everybody. I'm, I'm seeing 26 of you are still with me. So I'm gonna keep going and then we'll finish with boosters. Okay, um, so let me go forward a couple slides. Here we go. So again, if you are worried about this vaccine being new and untested, we have um, 190 million people in this country who have been fully vaccinated, uh, another 9 million who have gotten booster doses. And the CDC has done a great job of looking at the safety and the surveillance of it. So we're at 66% of those people who are eligible, which by the way, is the worst out of any major industrialized country in the world. The G7 countries, we've fallen behind, which is really sad since we're the ones that developed these vaccines um, and uh, all the science was here, we should be doing a little bit better, but um, uh, that's the way it is. And then booster shots here, you can see there's already been 7 million uh, Pfizer booster shots and then 1.5 million Moderna booster shots. In San Diego, I mentioned this already, we're doing great as well. 80% of people have gotten uh, fully vaccinated. Another 9% have gotten their single vaccine. And I checked these numbers all myself and they're all true. Um, and so we're talking about 2.2 uh, million people out of 2.8 million that have gotten fully vaccinated. It's the vast majority 
Uh, sometimes you see it presented as, well, there's the vaxxers and the anti-vaxxers and they're about 50-50, it's not even close. It's more like 90% of people are vaccinated and 10% and are the ones that are really kind of loud and against the vaccines. Um, granted, a lot of people are hesitant in the middle and that's fine, um, but it's I think the anti-vaxxers have really taken uh, the rumor mill and social media and used it to their advantage. So we're really just talking about um, 200,000 people in San Diego that are really not had any vaccine yet. To address some of this information, the county's done a, a good job um, countering misinformation and they have this website set up which goes through frequently asked questions, what, it, what is a scientific paper and what is peer review, um, and goes through how we look at evidence and, and really proving what information is in science. And then they go through all these different topics on children, on masks, on testing, on vaccines, and all kinds of things and try to dispel all the rumors. And we had a nice video chat here, which is actually um, clickable on this website. Um, Dr. Mark Sawyer, who's from Brady Children's, did one of the talks here, and he just did a really nice summary of safety of vaccines and went over all the systems that CDC and FDA have in place to look at safety and, and what the quality of these different mechanisms are. You might've heard of VAERS, which is the Vaccine Adverse Event Reporting System. Um, that's kind of a wild, wide open, wild, wild west. Anybody can report whatever they want to VAERS. In fact, a scientist kind of tested the system and said that he got the flu shot and then turned into the Incredible Hulk. And uh, to his dismay, that showed up in bears as an adverse reaction to the flu shot, um, uh, just to see how wide open it was. So bears actually is just the baseline. Anybody can report anything. And that's why you see a lot of information that's not really causal in bears. People say 19,000 people have died from COVID vaccines and it's reported in bears. Well, that's not really true. That means that 19,000 people died in the several months after they got the, the vaccine and it may have nothing to do with the vaccine. In fact, it probably doesn't. What's a little more reliable are things like vSafe and vaccine safety data, link, safety data link, where they actually look into each case um, and, and see what the actual true rates are and, and what's causal. And from that, we know that there are a few very rare side effects uh, to these vaccines. I think we know this better for COVID vaccines than any other vaccine that we've had. Anaphylaxis, a serious allergic reaction, about one in a million. Um, a clot, blood clot called thrombosis, about five to 10 per million. Uh, a muscle disorder, a nerve disorder, five to 10 per million in Johnson & Johnson, and then myocarditis at 24 cases per million. And most people don't have the ability to get their mind around how rare that is. That is extremely rare. Um, in fact, you know, the rate of getting hit by lightning is about two per million. So um, we're talking about that range for some of these things um, of how, how uncommon it is. Okay, let's get to boosters. And here's the slide where I try to sort of put it all together. There's a terminology of third doses and boosters. And I'm just gonna say right now to divide the two, third doses are for people that are immunocompromised and may not have responded to their primary series. And way back in August, um, third doses were recommended for anybody who falls into this immunocompromised category. That's people on chemotherapy, people with HIV AIDS, uh, with low T cells, people who are getting medicines for other diseases that suppress their immune system, such as steroids and other things, those people should get a third dose of whatever they got right away, and they don't even have to wait. Um, so 28 days after, they should be getting that third dose right away. This again is Colin Powell, um, somebody who probably didn't respond too well to the initial series of vaccines and should have gotten a third dose. Um, vaccines aren't perfect. They're not going to really provoke a really big response in people whose immune systems are not very strong. Um, people with multiple myeloma, which is what Colin Powell had, I saw a study that only about 40% of them are really going to respond to the vaccine at all. Now, on to the rest of the population, we have Pfizer, Moderna, and Johnson & Johnson, and this has all happened in the last week that booster doses are now recommended for all three of them. You're supposed to wait six months after your last dose before you get a booster for Pfizer, six months after for Moderna. And then Johnson & Johnson, just because the studies were designed differently, they said two months. Um, and, and that's recommended as well. And they've also recommended mix and match, and I'll get into that in just a little bit. I'm going to sort of skip through some of these because I have some slides that make things look a little bit more straightforward. Um, in terms of uh, who is immunocompromised, uh, this is the list here that's fairly complicated, but um, if you have a question, you can ask your doctor or I can ask, take a question later on. Um, and then in terms of the general population, this is the type of data that the CDC and FDA looked at, which is that in people who are older than 60 years of age, 
uh, we started to see declines in vaccine effectiveness um, when the Delta uh, variant came around. And you can see from any infection or from symptomatic infection, uh, vaccines like Pfizer that were originally 95% effective have dropped sort of in the high 70s to 80s, still providing pretty good protection from hospitalization and from severe disease. But the question was, you know, is this getting low enough that we need to do something about it? It has also been observed that not all the vaccines are equal. And in fact, when we look at antibody levels for Moderna, which is here, versus Pfizer, which is here, versus J&J, &J, they're definitely not as equivalent with each other. And we've even started to see a little bit of a slippage of protection against hospitalization, where Moderna has slipped to about 93% protection, Pfizer to about 88%, and then J&J &J to 71%. So this is the discussion that happened around whether boosters are needed. And so what they did is they, they first took the question, does the whole population need boosters? And the answer was no. Younger people who are relatively health, healthy do not need boosters because their immune system are working normally. Um, let's focus on the more vulnerable people. Um, and this is the recommendation that came out first for Pfizer. Now they split it into those who should get boosters and those who may get boosters. And it's a little complicated, but I'll walk you through it. And then I have a graphic at the end that I'll show you that I can finish on. Um, they debated the data and it looked like the evidence is strongest for those who are older than 65, people that live in long-term care facilities of any age, really above age 18, and then those above age 50 who have underlying medical conditions. Those people really should get a booster in order to protect themselves because they're the most vulnerable and those are the ones that probably didn't mount a super strong response to the vaccine in the first place. Now, there are other groups who may get boosters and those are younger people age 18 to 49 with underlying medical conditions. And there's a really long list of underlying medical conditions, but it's anything you would think of like diabetes or heart disease, lung disease, asthma, um, things like that. And then this was a controversial thing at the end there where the evidence wasn't all that strong, but the CDC director thought that healthcare workers and those uh, that are essential workers probably should, should go ahead and get a vaccine, even though the evidence isn't really strong that they need one they may be able to get a vaccine if they have occupational risk like I do as a healthcare worker. Here's the long list of, uh, of medical conditions that qualify. You can see lots of different things, cancer and obesity and pregnancy uh, and a lot of other things are there. And I'm just gonna finish up really quick with the final slide. This is the mix and match study, which is very complicated. I'm gonna stay away from it um, just to get you to the final end here. So one, uh, important point for the purposes of work or going to a concert or going to a movie theater or a show, the definition of being fully vaccinated has not changed. So if you've gotten a, a primary series of two doses of, J, of Pfizer or Moderna, you're fine. Or you've gotten a single J&J &J and you show your card, that still counts as fully vaccinated. And so uh, the boosters are not going to really change that for the purposes of mandates or things like that. Now, this is my final two slides here. Um, just to ho hopefully make this really clear. The first question is, are you eligible or should you really get a vaccine? And the answer hopefully I've made clear to you is that if you're above age 65, yeah, you really should. You're gonna be in that category where your immunity is fading a little bit and you're still at high risk of dying of COVID. If you're 50 to 65 with an underlying medical condition, yep, you probably should as well. Or if somebody's in a, a long-term care facility really of any age, you should. Those who want to may get a booster if you're 18 to 49 with an underlying medical condition or 18 and above with an occupational exposure like me. And that little line on the bottom, the rest of the population, there's not really strong evidence that younger people or those without underlying medical conditions or occupational exposure need a booster, at least right now. So not the whole country, but uh, those in the following categories. Now, if you should get one, what should you get? Well, if you're immunocompromised, you should, you should have gotten it already, a Pfizer or a Moderna, um, really just a month after your last dose. So that, you know, again, that's Colin Powell, who should have been uh, get, getting that booster really quite a while ago. We unfortunately didn't have a recommendation for J&J. &J. If you got a J&J, &J, the FDA has been very flexible about this and says you can kind of get whatever you want. You can get a Pfizer, you can get a half-dose Moderna, which is what the booster strength looks like for Moderna, or you can get another J&J. &J, and you can do it quickly, just two months after that last dose. If you got Pfizer, you can actually do all three if you want, or Moderna, you can do all three if you want, but the recommendation is six months after. Um, the part that I skipped over really fast gets into which one's better. 
And I'll just cut to the chase here. It looks like the Moderna vaccine uh, works the best as a booster, especially in those that got J&J first. So that's why mix and match is being allowed is because you, people actually got a much higher response after uh, the Moderna booster, even if they got J&J &J, than any of the other ones. Um, the FDA didn't really choose which one was better. They just kind of put it out there. Uh, clinicians are supposed to do that themselves. And the CDC just finished meeting right now. I don't know what they actually said in terms of guiding people one way or the other. All right, so I think I'm finished and I'm gonna stop with my slides and um, take your questions. Awesome, thank you so much for that, Dr. Amers. Now, before we jump into the Q&A, um, Vivi and I are going to share our Halloween safety tips. That's also why it's called boosters as Halloween is approaching. So go ahead, Vivian. Yeah, so if you do go trick-or-treating um, on Halloween, remember to stay with your group and social distance while you're out and about, especially if you're lining up for candy in front of someone's home. Um, please keep your mask on as often as possible, regardless of your vaccination status, so that everyone can be safe and have a good Halloween. Now, if you don't want to do trick-or-treating, the alternative I have for you is hosting an outdoor candy exchange with your family members, friends, people that you know are vaccinated. If you are mixing with folks that are not vaccinated, ask them to wear um, masks at all time. Keep it brief. Um, having this candy exchange at an outdoor park or perhaps a roomy backyard could really optimize with airflow. Um, you can prepackage the candy bags ahead of time, have hand sanitizing stations around that way people can um, clean their hands before eating. You could also incorporate a Halloween contest. You can incorporate having like mass creativity with their Halloween contest as well. And also having this candy exchange early in the day means that folks won't be out late at night, right before the school and work week, so everyone can get their rest. Alrighty, so now we're gonna go ahead and jump into the Q&A. Now, like I mentioned earlier, we do have some pre-submitted questions from our community members. So I'm gonna go ahead and jump with those first. And so let's go ahead and start off with some general booster questions. So Dr. Amers, let's just um, sort of solidify this, this statement and let's just get it out there. Do the boosters mean that the vaccine isn't working? Really good question. So that's, that's why I felt like I had to go to the basic immunology because <laughs> Um, there is no vaccine that protects 100% of people 100% of the time. And, and I think the expectations were a little bit over the top when these vaccines first came out. There is some debate in the scientific community about how much is the immunity waning down a little bit and how much is the Delta variant, because they kind of both happened at the same time. But I would say that the vaccines are still doing really, really good at what they really can do, uh, which is prevent hospitalization and death and prevent people from getting really, really sick. The decision about whether we're gonna try to protect all people from ever getting COVID is a decision that like Israel, for example, uh, they went for it and they're now giving third doses and boosters to everybody. And the US kind of looked at it and said, no, I think if you're young and don't have a medical condition, you're, you're still doing pretty well from your vaccine. Um, so it's a complicated answer, but I think um, the other thing is that some vaccines that we use now, like for hepatitis B, for example, the, the main series for hep B is a dose at, at time zero, a dose at one to two months, and a dose at six months. And there, there's a, a well-worn pattern of that being a really good way to do the vaccines. And the initial trials that were done with the COVID vaccine just didn't incorporate that six-month dose. And so we're just sort of adding that on. It may be that three doses is really what we need. I really doubt there's going to be a fourth dose as part of the primary series, unless we have some crazy new variant uh, that is not covered by these vaccines. Got it, thank you. Now, why is it that we do have to wait six months for the booster and will the booster last another six months? So waiting six months, the immune system actually matures in between doses. And uh, it just turns out that you get a better response if you wait a little while. And some of that has to do with the fact that the immune system has this really difficult challenge at all times of trying to tell what is yourself and what is an enemy. If you expose something to the body uh, very, very frequently, the immune system actually gets less and less. That's the principle behind allergy shots. If you've ever had an allergy, uh, how do you do that? Well, you do small doses very frequently of something, and then your immune system actually calms down. 
So in order to really be sure that the immune system knows this is foreign, you got to leave it alone for a while, uh, wait six months, and then you'll get a much better response that way. As far as how long it's going to last, I don't really know. But um, you know, I think even with the primary series, the two-dose series from Moderna and Pfizer, we have very good long-term memory thus far. The booster is just making it better. So I think it'll probably last more than six months after that. Got it. Thank you. Um, so we're going to go ahead and jump over to um, vaccine importance. So many people seem suspicious that this vaccine is free and even incentivized um, when most healthcare in the U.S. is expensive. Can you talk more about the preventative versus reactive healthcare? Yeah, I saw this question and I'm glad it was asked because it, it really points out some major flaws with U.S. healthcare that I cannot defend at all. I mean, we do actually have a sickness system, not a wellness system, whereas many other countries spend a whole lot less money on healthcare than we do, and they do a much better job of prevention. Um, I think the reason um, you don't need to be suspicious about why this is being pushed so much, it's being pushed so much because COVID has just been so devastating to our economy that everybody wants to move on from it. Um, and it's a respiratory disease that is very easily spread. And the vaccines are really the best thing that we have. So, so that's why things are being made free just to get those rates as high as we can so we can really move forward. Um, but the questioner is absolutely right that our system is much more set up to respond reactively to illness rather than prevent. So it's kind of a, a change in the way we've been doing things compared to other countries. Thank you. Now we've been seeing more and more people from across the border who have been telling us that they've gotten the Sputnik vaccine. Um, what would you recommend for people that have gotten a vaccine other than Pfizer, Moderna, or J and J? Okay, so this gets pretty complicated um, because there's lots of vaccines out there, and only only three of them are approved by the FDA in the U.S., and then only another two more, three more, are approved by the WHO. So there's kind of a, a list that's accepted uh, by the CDC, for example, and a list that's accepted by WHO. Sputnik is not on either of those lists. So the advice from the CDC is that if you got one that's on the FDA list or on the WHO list, then you're okay. And you don't really need another series at all. You can get a booster, uh, but you don't need to immediately get another one. But if you got one that's not on that list, you really should start from scratch and get a full series of a, an approved vaccine. The other two that are um, approved by WHO are the AstraZeneca and then the Sinovac, which is a Chinese uh, vaccine, but Sputnik is not on there. And it just has to do with the quality of the data that was done when the vaccines were studied. And if you have low quality data or you haven't done a big enough trial, it's not gonna get recognized by FDA or the WHO. Thank you. Already at this time, Vivian's gonna go ahead and take it away and go in with the audience submitted Q&A. Yeah, so um, got a couple questions here from our attendees. I'll start off with the first one. Um, I heard that the FDA gave the okay for the Moderna booster, but that we shouldn't get it until the CDC puts out more guidelines to match it. Is that true? That is absolutely true, but the CDC just about an hour ago finished with their meeting. <laughs> um, so it's coming very, very soon. Everything happens in a very um, orderly fashion. This is the way it's been for... I don't know, decades, FDA looks at all the data and says, we approve this as a product. And then CDC really looks at the implementation, how are we going to do this? And sometimes they don't quite agree with each other, but most of the time they do. Um, I got a little news flash right before we started that CDC did give the thumbs up about getting it, which means that we're going to be able to start doing this probably tomorrow, I would say. Now, there are some things that are a little um, nuanced here, especially with respect to the Moderna vaccine, because that boost is actually half the dose of the original one. And I'm not quite sure if we're allowed to just measure half or if we have to get new vials with different dosing in there. So um, I'll have to look into that and get back to you. But um, uh, green light is really happening as of tomorrow, I would say, once CDC puts out the recommendations. Awesome. Thank you for that, Dr. Amers. Um, next question. I am 30 weeks pregnant. I received my first dose of Moderna on January 16th and received my second dose on February 13th. I would like to get the booster in hopes that it'll pass some immunity to my baby. Is a Moderna booster recommended for pregnant women at this time? 
Yep, I am very glad that uh, whoever asked that question. I, if, can I share my slide again just to show the answer? Um, yeah. That's, there sure. we go. There so this is the big long list of conditions that put you at higher risk of dying of COVID and pregnancy is right there. Um, pregnancy and recent pregnancy on this list. And these, by the way, these three different squares are level of evidence. And this is the highest level of evidence. We know for sure that pregnant women are at high risk of dying uh, from COVID. And we also know that pregnant women have generally lower vaccination rates because they tend to be more hesitant. So I'm glad the person asked. We, we know that um, the, for the two doses that you already got are probably already going to help you share your antibodies and your immunity with your baby both through the placenta and through breastfeeding, uh, but that booster dose will be even better. It'll, it'll give you higher levels of uh, antibody and you certainly do qualify. So it's just a matter of calling your doctor's office and seeing if they're ready to go. Um, like I said, this happened just today where, where CDC gave the green light. Alrighty. Um, our next question is, do you recommend to stick to one type of vaccination when getting the booster shot? And I believe we talked about some mixing and matching in your slides as well, Dr. Ramers. We did. Maybe it's time to go to the mixing and matching slide that I skipped over, if you don't mind. Um, yeah. A little complicated, but um, so this is the study um, that the NIH did. And um, just to give a little background, um, you know, the reason that we didn't have uh, mix and match information right away is because these um, initial studies were paid for by the vaccine makers. And a Pfizer company doesn't want you to take another vaccine for your third dose. But thankfully, the NIH did this study where they took 458 people with, these are the technical names, but that's Moderna and then J&J &J and Pfizer vaccine. And they divided them into nine groups. So um, all different groups, here you can see them where they took people that got each of those three in the beginning and they mixed them up into nine groups, 50 in each group where they each gave them the third of a different type. So I hope that makes sense. There's, this table here is gonna show it to you um, in even more detail. Okay, so on the left-hand side here, these are people in the red circle that all got um, J and J. And then the, the left-hand side, D is those that got boosted with Moderna. In the middle, those that got boosted, let me get my pen going here. In the middle, those that got boosted with J&J, &J, so just a second dose of J&J, &J, and then those that got boosted with Pfizer here. So these are people that, you know, we've been feeling a little neglected because their, their antibodies are getting low. Um, and what do we do with them? So here's the boost that they got in terms of antibody levels from before the vaccine to after getting the Moderna boost, a huge increase here, which was actually 76 times the levels of their antibodies. If they just got a second J&J, &J, here's the increase they got, four times as high. And if they got a Pfizer, another pretty good increase here, about 35 times. So I'm curious, I actually haven't had time to read what the CDC says, but for J&J &J people, I would recommend a Moderna vaccine um, because they had such a huge boost here um, 76 times the antibody levels. Just to go quickly through the other two groups, if you got a Moderna to begin with, and then you got a Moderna booster, pretty good, tenfold increase here, not too bad. If you got a, a, a um, Moderna first and then got a J&J, &J, you got a six-fold increase here. Moderna first and then a Pfizer, it's about an 11-fold increase. So you can generally see that the Moderna and the Pfizer boosters are working a little bit better. And then to the third group here, those that got Pfizer in the beginning, if they got a Moderna boost, pretty good response, 31-fold increase in antibody levels. If they got a um, Pfizer and then a J&J, &J, a 12-fold increase here, not bad, but not great. And then a third Pfizer is here where you get a 20-fold increase. So that's a little complicated, but hopefully that, that kind of tells the story that it looks like the Moderna and the Pfizer boosters are a little bit better in terms of giving better responses. Thank you for that, Dr. Amers. Um, we have another question here. If you're not in a category that needs a booster, but you live with immunocompromised family members, is it safer to get a booster to protect them? It's a really good question. And, and I think you probably could look closely at the details and, and get yourself to qualify. It certainly is gonna decrease your chance of getting an infection and passing it on to the immunocompromised person. Um, so I think that's probably a one-on-one -on -one discussion with your doctor. And if you showed up in my office and asked for it, I would certainly give you that vaccine. All right. And 
Um, I know we mentioned um, vaccines that aren't Moderna, Pfizer, J and J, and I believe we have a question in the chat here about that as well. So it's if I received AstraZeneca vaccine in my country, can I get Pfizer in the U.S.? Yeah, so AstraZeneca is one of those that falls on the WHO approved list. So the CDC would say, nope, you're considered fully vaccinated. Uh, but in terms of boosters, I think you probably should qualify for a booster if it's been six months from your last AstraZeneca vaccine. All right. And I've got another question I think is really important with the flu season coming up. Can I get a booster shot and a flu shot at the same time? Yeah, early on, uh, the recommendation was to not take anything within 14 days before or after a COVID vaccine, but that was just out of extreme caution. Uh, and that's been thrown out the window. We, we now allow vaccines to happen at the same time. Um, there's been some, some questions like, well, am I gonna get worse side effects? And we don't really know, you might have a little bit more, um, but the flu shot is really important time-wise and the flu season is really getting underway. There's already been 215 flu cases in San Diego. Um, so you certainly have a green light to get them at the same time. I would suggest getting them in different arms just so you can kind of know what's going on. Um, some people that have COVID vaccines have seven days after as their immune system is just starting to respond, they get a little redness on the skin. So that might be important just to, for your doctor to know uh, which side you got the COVID vaccine on. Awesome. Um, and here is another question. Um, if you've had a confirmed case of prior COVID and two Pfizer vaccines, do you still need a booster? And the um, person who asked said they are over 55 and an essential worker. Yeah, so by the book, I would say you can get one if you want to, but there are plenty of studies out there that show people that have natural immunity plus vaccine mediated immunity are super protected. Um, they actually have the best immune protection of anybody. Um, and so you're already probably in pretty good shape. A third dose or a booster is not going to hurt. It's just going to give you a little more protection. But um, you should know that um, as it's called actually hybrid immunity in, in some of the immunology circles, where you have your own baseline immune um, system, we, we generally consider getting COVID as almost the same as getting a single dose of a vaccine, which is why getting COVID by itself is not enough to make you fully protected. You need that second dose. And then if you got a third one, um, then you have really good immunity. It's kind of optional for you. Um, if you are an essential worker, you would technically be in that category where you could get one if you want. Um, so it's kind of up to you. I wouldn't urge you the way I would urge a, you know, a 65 year old with uh, immunosuppression, um, but it's likely to do nothing but get, get you more protection. Yeah, all righty. Thank you for that, Dr. Ramers. Um, got one last question here. If you misplaced your card with the shot series, are you still able to get a booster shot or will you have to start from scratch to show that you have been fully vaccinated? It's a good question. You know, the systems that are in place to track vaccines are not perfect, um, but the state of California has gone with a QR code system. And theoretically, if everybody did everything right and the person that gave you the vaccine logged your information correctly, you should be able to look yourself up on the state website and then get that QR code. And that actually serves as proof of vaccination if you need it for traveling or for anything else. That would also be proof of when you got it to show the person that you need a booster. Now, in terms of boosters, um, we're supposed to just accept the person's word for it um, if they have a medical condition uh, or if they're an essential worker and not really make too many barriers. And that's, that should be the case for, for getting a third dose as well. Um, I know that a lot of pharmacies like CVS and Walgreens, they'll just take your word for it and give you another dose. But I'd say the first step is to go to the California uh, Department of Public Health website. I forget the actual name. I'll try to look for it in a second. Um, but try to get your QR code that really uh, is your proof of vaccination and then bring that to your provider. Yeah. All righty. And I think this last one... We'll close out our session for today. If I'm vaccinated, should I still get tested for COVID? Yep, I'll tell you, I'm vaccinated and I still get tested for COVID. <laughs> um, and it's really, um, I feel pretty well protected from getting really sick from it, but I don't want to transmit it. And people that are vaccinated can still have some of those breakthrough cases. 
this Delta variant uh, is, is a much more infectious virus than the original SARS-CoV-2 or COVID virus. And there've been some studies showing that the Delta can even get at higher levels in the nose than the other virus and sometimes equal between vaccinated and unvaccinated people. People that are vaccinated have viral levels that fall more quickly, but you still could pass it on to other people. Um, so it is fine to get tested again. Um, getting tested for COVID should become kind of a regular thing that we know how to do. Um, you know, I don't think you need to test regularly if you're not exposed. Um, that's a little bit over the top. But if you have any symptoms, absolutely, you should get tested. Um, or if you're in kind of a high risk or high exposure situation. All right. Um, I believe that is all we have for now, Dr. Ramers. Are there any messages you'd like to reiterate for our audience today before we end here? You know, boosters, um, it, it is pretty complicated. It's complicated even for all of our providers. I hope I didn't lose you on the PowerPoint. Um, but basically, uh, the FDA and the CDC have kind of made it easy that everyone can get one if they're in one of these categories. You can go from vaccine to vaccine now. And, and again, I would say my personal advice, I don't know what CDC has said on this, but I would say the Moderna and the Pfizer boosters look like they're working a little bit better. Um, if you're still hesitant, go talk to your doctor. These vaccines are so incredibly safe. Um, there's a lot of misinformation out there that, that makes people scared and anxious about it. Um, and a lot of them are just simply not true or they're rumors. Um, and, and talk to your provider about it and get your questions answered because it really truly is the best way to protect yourself. Hopefully I reinforce that by showing you what we're seeing in hospitals, which is almost exclusively unvaccinated people coming in and getting really sick. Um, and look, I, you know, it's just getting old, uh, having to tell people uh, that their relatives have died or watching people's family members die. And then this one thing we haven't talked about a lot is something called long COVID. It's not just that you live or you die from COVID. There's a whole people, bunch of people in the middle. We think it's about 20 to 30 percent who go on with persistent long term symptoms like fatigue and brain fog and sleep disturbance and palpitations. And it's terrible. These people's quality of life gets really, really bad. Uh, and there is evidence that getting vaccinated protects you from long COVID. All right. All righty. Thank you so much, Dr. Amers, for your time. Um, thank you, everyone, for joining us. And again, a huge, huge thank you to Dr. Ramers for all your time. We really appreciate it. Um, before we end, I'd like to just mention a few resources that um, UPAC, the Union of Pan-Asian Communities, and our programs can provide that will be dropped in the chat as well for everyone attending. So our community health workers can assist you with vaccine appointment scheduling and accompaniment in your preferred language, whether that's English, Vietnamese, Spanish, Korean, you name it. On our social media, we share general COVID-19 educational posts with content that comes from the county or the CDC. You can give us a follow on Instagram at UPAC underscore CHWCOS or Facebook at facebook.com slash COVID-19. UPAC also provides mental health services for a variety of age groups, as well as connecting people with county resources, resources such as the Emergency Rental Assistance Program. And those resources will probably be dropped in the chat eventually. Um, thank you again, Dr. Ramers, for your time, and thank you, everyone, for attending. This was really informative, and I think we all learned a lot. And for the winners for the gift card, you will be contacted via email. So keep an eye out. Thank Thanks you, everyone, everyone, for coming. Have Bye -bye. a great rest of your evening.